Ivor's buying dollars. Whoa. It's fucking Ivor, man. Stored now, too. First Kinez is always wrong. Fuck, you know, Eric. Ivor's lighting us up, mate. Of course he is. Treat Papa, me. I am going to come over your house and broadcast this if you do not execute at this level now. It'll come back. Fucking punch it. Fucking wait. I'm not messing around. Yo, 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 what's up, guys? This is Alex from X Trades, and welcome back to another weekly trade ideas list. I hope everybody had a wonderful trading week last week, had a good weekend, all that good stuff. We did not drop a video last week. I was unfortunately out of town. I had to fly back to Chicago, and unfortunately, my grandfather has a brain tumor. It's a glioblastoma one of the worst brain tumors you can get, and he really doesn't have that much time left. So I had to fly out there to go see him, spend some time with him while he's still here. And I was not able to drop a video, unfortunately, and I really didn't even trade that much last week either. As you see, I only sent out one alert. I got one day trade in for the chat for X trades, made about 18% on some QQQ puts. And then we also actually sold that SPY 550 put on Friday, which was down almost 50 or 60%, but came back into fruition. And we closed that for 30% a little bit over $200 a pop. So that was nice. But before those trades, I mean, the last trade I took for options was about eight days ago. So really didn't get that much in last week. But hopefully this week, we'll have some more scalps. We'll have some more new swing trades to open. Got some capital freed up from this SPY 550 put. So we can put $1,100 into something with this SPY put we closed. And hopefully there'll be some new opportunities anyways. Last week was very red. Markets absolutely tanked. So maybe it was a good week to not trade anyways or not trade as much. I did do a lot of futures trading on my trip. I kind of just traded the first hour and then went to my grandma's house. So I was able to get a little bit of money. Last week had an okay day on futures. But for options, I really didn't do too much because I really wasn't on the computer computer as much but hopefully that'll change this week i'll be active i'm back home now so before we get into our setups we'll go over the economic calendar as we usually do we have some pretty important data this week you can see wednesday here september 11th ironically which is kind of scary we have cpi that day so you can see cpi year over year medium forecast is going to be 2.6 percent we have the core cpi medium forecast coming in at 0.2 percent and then core cpi year over year coming in at 3.2 so as you can see here we're only expecting a drop from the previous report in the cpi year over year our previous was 2.9 percent that was the previous reading we're expecting 2.6 as the median and then for core cpi and also core cpi year over year we're expecting the same readings at 0.2% and also 3.2% for the median right here. So really, we're only expecting a change from the last report in the CPI year over year. They're expecting about 0.3% lower from 2.9. And I really feel like the past couple times CPI has came out, it's starting to lose a little bit of that spark or knee-jerk reaction. The swings for the CPI wasn't as big last time. Maybe that was because the PPI came out first. So maybe this week we actually will have a pretty big swing for the CPI data since PPI comes in after it. Last month, PPI came in first and then CPI came in. So maybe that PPI reading kind of made it a little bit softer of a move since the PPI came out first. But either way, the narrative with inflation, I mean, it's been steadily going down. We already know the Fed's going to start cutting rates in September. It's going to come up very soon. We don't know if the Fed's going to do 25 basis points or if they're going to do 50 basis points. But either way, we are expecting cuts and I'm almost positive they are going to cut. They've already signaled it. Unless like CPI just totally reignites and we completely go over the forecast, I would expect rate cuts in September. Even if it's just a little 25 basis point cut, I believe they are going to start doing that because inflation is steadily coming down. And I feel like that inflation scare narrative is kind of going away. People aren't really caring as much about inflation because it has been coming down pretty steadily. I would say the Fed has done a pretty good job for the most part. Who knows if their rate hikes are what brought CPI down. There's a lot of speculation that it was transitory and they didn't even need to raise rates in the first place. But I believe the Fed's massive hike cycle in the short amount of time that they did hike rates really brought pressure down in the CPI, really cooled down demand, cooled down the labor market, as we saw in the non-farm payrolls, as we saw in the unemployment rate ticking up, stuff like that. And then on Thursday, we have core PPI, PPI year over year, and also core PPI year over year. So the producer side of prices will come out the day after CPI. And then on Friday, just consumer sentiment. So I don't see any Fed speakers this week, just CPI, we have PPI, and also consumer sentiment. So definitely pay attention to those. We'll go ahead and go over seasonality real quick before we get into our setups. This is going to be September 9th. 
to the 13th. So here's the 10 year data set. We have winning trades to the short side going for 60% with a summarized profit of 3%. You can kind of see the market get a little bump up here from the 10th to the 12th. Not exactly sure if that will show up in the markets given how bearish we closed last week, but you never know. We could see a dead cap bounce in the SPY and the QQQ. And then for the 20 year data set, it's actually a little bit more bullish it has more data so obviously this could be a little bit more reliable you can see the system is testing long trades here we have winning trades at 65 percent with a summarized profit at 11 percent with a really nice uptick actually here all the way until mid-september and then a huge drop off i would say we've been following the 10-year data set a little bit better the past couple of weeks as you can see we've kind of just been dropping since september and I would say this is pretty accurate how we've been following it from the last couple of weeks. And then you can see for the 20 year, not as big of a drop, kind of just more range bound and a little bit more bullish coming into this week. So you got two mixed signals. You got 10 year, a little bit more bearish neutral with 20 year, a lot more bullish. Winning trades are high. Summarized profit is high for this week's period. And we'll go over the SPY later. As soon as we go over our setups, we go over the indexes after so we can kind of get a reading on what levels to pay attention to. If we could be more bullish or bearish, we'll go over that later. And we'll kind of compare that to the seasonality later. All right, now to our setups for the week. Our first one here is actually pretty interesting because it's a little bit more risky given how risk off on tech the market has been going. We're going to be watching NVIDIA for calls this week, probably just a day trade. But given NVIDIA is not too expensive to swing overnight, like the premiums aren't awful if you bought october expiration it's really not that bad i mean it's only a hundred dollars a share after the split so the options are a little bit more affordable to swing but as well if you really don't want to swing in this market given september sucks and people don't really go risk on until october and the rest of the year you could just watch this for day trades and what we're watching is this old kind of back test res area. This is previous resistance. You can see 97.40, kind of a double top back here in March and April of 24 with a really nice bounce level or back test level here in August of 24 with a really gnarly bounce, really gnarly dead cap bounce to lead to the upper trend line. We rejected the upper trend line and also rejected this kind of, I would call this a drop based drop supply zone. You can see this big supply candle was a very big res area led to a very big rejection. Really nice base candle, very accurate though. This would have been a great short once you saw price coming back within this little downtrend line. That was a great short to kind of go back down to the bottom trend line or at least the back test area we're covering right now. So kudos if you went short Nvidia, obviously you would have had to go short a little bit before their earnings report or you could have just went short after. You can see it kind of didn't really start breaking down aggressively until the day after earnings. So you could have gone short before or after and it would have paid. But either way, this is pretty simple. You're kind of waiting for it to get a little bit lower, at least until it gives you a more solid signal. Like I wouldn't just randomly buy right here. I want it closer to 100, maybe 97s, maybe this little trend line, this little area, just a little bit closer and look for a dead cap bounce there. That'd be a good call scout. I'm kind of expecting a down Friday, down Monday type situation maybe. It's a pretty common pattern given how red we were. You can see the indexes spy down 1.6, QQQ almost down 3%. You might see a little bit of that bleeding into Monday and then sometimes you'll see a big buy on Tuesday and you'll see a really big green day after down Friday, down Monday by Tuesday. And I started to pay attention to that pattern when somebody in our chat named Big T showed that to me, the down Friday, down Monday by Tuesday. It's a pretty good pattern to kind of expect after a big red Friday. So we'll see if Nvidia can get down into this little uptrend line, maybe get down to 97.40. You can see it actually had to go a little bit lower. It gapped down all the way to, you can see it actually went even lower than that. But the important thing was this closed back over that 97.40. Here was the close, even though it went all the way down to 90, the important thing is that it closed back over and that set us up for that big run. So just watch that zone, that 97.40, watch 100 flat as a psychological level. It kind of already got there pretty much towards the end of the day yeah you can see here at about noon we hit about 101 so just watch this area it might need to go a little bit lower but nvidia looking for a dead cap bounce once it gets over to this area you can see the 200 ema is all the way down here macd is still negative so it's a little bit risky but either way if it gets down here look for a bounce short-term calls could be a good day trade all right now to number two which is dollar general we're going to be looking at a longer term setup on this i really like this for pretty much january expiration maybe a little bit longer i feel like really any stock that is pretty reliant on consumer spending 
spending does pretty good towards the end of the year, given the holidays and the winter time people really like to spend. And you can kind of see that reflect in the stock prices for a lot of stores, really anything that's very consumer reliant and relies on consumer spending, you will see that reflect towards the end of the year if people are spending a lot. So it really just depends on the economic conditions that we're going into. You know, obviously demand has probably slowed down a little bit. Interest rates are high. Inflation has eaten people's bank accounts and consumer habits have changed. And we've seen that reflect in Dollar General. I mean, they gapped down very aggressively. You can see the key facts. Dollar General Corporation stock fell 30.95% after disappointing second quarter results, leading analysts to cut their forecast for the company. So that's why this big gap down candle happened. They had a pretty bad earnings and analyst forecasts were slashed. So this is pretty much a dead cap bounce type play. You're definitely taking some risk, but that's why I'm only looking at maybe January expiration minimum, December. I would go with January to be safe. There's not really like a huge reversal signal here yet. I'm kind of just eyeing this really big gap. I feel like eventually this will fill back up and they really don't even report until December again. So that December report might be pretty important for them to get back into play here. But overall, I do like this for a longer term setup. Looking at January expiration, it's very risky as you can see we broke a pretty big support right here but overall to me i mean on the one week on the one month this looks very overcooked to the downside and eventually it probably will have some type of dead cap bounce so that's for dg looking at calls january expiration it's going to be a swing trade maybe we can at least get up to the gap star it's going to be like 97 96 bucks up to the gap area because once it gets up here it can act as resistance i can show you many examples of that it actually just happened to intel they kind of dead cap bounced into the gap area and then intel just completely sold off from that area so if you want to use that as a price target or use the 921 ema cloud whatever you want to use the 50 ema those could be good price targets from 82 dollars. i mean 96 would be pretty pretty good. It's not a small move by any means. So that's for DG. Be patient. Buy lots of time. Be careful. It could still go lower. Obviously, you don't have a crazy signal yet. So just keep a long-term mindset with this one. Really big gap. I love shopping at DG. I have one by my house. I go there all the time. I literally just left there you know, about 30 minutes ago. So just keep an eye on it. Maybe even look for shares. I don't think they pay a dividend or anything, but good company. Really just needs more consumer spending to pick up. Maybe Q4 can do that. End of the year could be good. All right. And last but not least, we'll go over Target. So I actually put this out in the watchlist channel when it was about here. And what I really liked about this is the 921 EMA cloud, obviously. So we had a really good quarter, really nice earnings that kind of gave back. Has already filled more than 50% of the earnings gap. And then you also have the 200 EMA, which is the dots. And you also have the 50 EMA, which is this little line right here. And then you have your 921 cloud, which is your green cloud right here, kind of all in the same spot. So look at that as confluence. You also have a little wick area right here at about 149s and a perfectly wicked right here on Wednesday and then kind of got stuck in a range. So there was a bounce off the 50 EMA and the 200 EMA, a pretty nice one actually. Even though it was short term, that could have been a good day trade. You had this really big dip and really big buyers came in and pushed it back up just short term and then really found some resistance here at the 200 EMA on the 15 minute. You got a rejection, a rejection, and a rejection. So next week, Target probably will need to get over that 15 minute 200 EMA. It even kind of rejected right here as well. So this is a clear short-term area of resistance. You're definitely gonna wanna watch that. And then for a setup like this, it's pretty simple. You're kind of just using the moving averages as your risk off or risk on. So if it starts closing under the 200 EMA again, you could probably just not look at it anymore and stop out. But either way, you do have support here. You have the 21 EMA part of the cloud. Probably needs to get back over the nine part of the cloud, which is the upper upper band right here. Probably needs to close back over that and that could really bring it back up. But either way, you got the 50 and the 200 in the same spot. That's good support. If we can bounce from this, I really like it back up to 160s and then 167, which is the kind of earnings gap high. I mean, it's not the best looking chart. Like you don't have a clear pattern. You're kind of just going off the moving averages. You got support here. So you're just kind of taking a stab using risk off or SL below that 200 EMA. If it you know, closes under that, you could stop out. But that's for Target. I'm looking at calls. I would probably go with November. If you really want to be a little bit more risky, October monthlies are good too. 
but I do like this setup. You got multiple moving averages. Looks pretty good. Had a really good earnings. As you saw, price reflect. We gapped up very aggressively. Just kind of gave some back. Now maybe at a value area. So definitely watch this area. Looking pretty good for a bounce. All right, guys. And on to SPY. So we go over this every single week, usually. Last week, I was absent. So we kind of have some new structures going on here. But a couple weeks ago from the last video we made, we were really focused on this big rally-based drop supply. I did mention I couldn't really see price go any higher than the supply because I'm just not going to project a new all-time high. I'd rather wait for the all-time high to break, then I can project higher. And this is a clear example of why I only project as high as the near supply zone. And this is just a perfect example of why. Even though we had good consolidation, we had the 921 email cloud kind of setting us up for a big base out to go higher this supply zone ended up being the king and it really brought us back down so we pulled up into this friday huge fake out because tuesday after labor day was a very red day we were also focused on this 555 a couple weeks ago this was kind of our line in the sand either it needed to break under or stay over that to kind of stay within this range and i'm pretty sure i mentioned 555 to supply was your trading range and that's exactly what we got you can see wednesday we pulled in the 555 here pulled up into supply by friday actually pulled up into supply on thursday as well as you can see by this wick on this thursday bar so 555 to supply was our trading range a couple weeks ago and then you can see once we got this breakdown bar under 555 that set us up for a drop based drop scenario and I actually put it out in the chat thursday for the nasdaq on this bar i mentioned due to the fact we had this big red bar and these two consolidation candles i did mention thursday I thought this looked good for a drop based drop scenario, which is exactly what happened on Friday. Once the non farms came out, obviously the market didn't like it much. Maybe they're tired of the revisions. They're tired of them not giving us honest data. Who knows? And we saw that reflect in price, huge drop, but really a clean drop based drop. Two days of consolidation leading to your big downside sell imbalance. But for this week, we're kind of focused on 537.45. So I've kind of marked key inflection points you probably want to watch. So you had the 555, which is a rejection, big sell imbalance area right here. Also short term support for this structure. 537.45 is an old bounce zone kind of structure low for this little area. And now we're kind of pulling into that. So that is the nearest support nearby. So if you want to watch that, you could probably look for a bounce or some type of short term scalp there, but definitely mark that 537.45. Keep an eye on it because there's really nothing in this area until we get to this big demand candle, which will be at 528.47. So that's all the way down here, this demand zone goes from 528 down to 518 basically. So this is a rally base rally type of demand structure that you can definitely watch. I feel like once price gets down here, you'll probably see some massive bouncing in this zone unless we just, you know, go straight through it and the VIX is going over 30 and we have a panic type scenario like this little structure right here. Otherwise, if we get down to this area, definitely mark this demand zone because this is a pretty big sell imbalance that led to big buying. So something happened in this day to lead to this big buy imbalance. So lots of liquidation, maybe lots of stop outs. And that gave us fuel to create this big, most hated rally all the way back to all time high, basically. So 528 will probably be big, which is the start of demand. And that goes all the way down to 518. But nearby right now, 537.45, which I showed you old structure low right here and also a breakout point right here. So this is kind of like the medium point bearish under bullish over. So we got extra bearish under 537s and then extra bullish over 537s. That's why I feel like this inflection point, probably pretty important to pay attention to going into next week. So watch this level. If we break under that, there's a little small gap you can pay attention to, which is right here. And I feel like once that gap closes, you can definitely bounce from that as well. It didn't happen for this gap, but that's kind of because we closed under it and we really didn't get any type of bounce signal. So usually once you get a gap close, you'll see some type of obvious bar like reaction bar, like a big bounce bar. And that's when you'll know that people are kind of flipping back bullish now that the gap has closed. That just didn't happen for this gap, as you can see. But either way, max downside, if this 537.45 doesn't hold for some reason, I can really only project down to demand, which is at the 528s. So that's for SPY, the nearby support, 537s, max downside at demand. I showed you that one day demand candle. You're definitely going to want to mark that. That is from August 7th. So you mark the open of this August 7th candle down to the low that will give you your demand zone. So you're going to be watching 528s down to 518 as a potential demand zone. 
assuming 537 doesn't hold, which could be possible. September sucks. VIX is kind of creeping back up, but 2237, really not that bad. I think once it gets over 23 and starts closing over 23, things will get scary again. But right now, I mean, VIX 22, it's really not awful, which also means it can go higher. So there's two ways to look at it. Either the VIX can go higher since we went all the way to fucking 65 last time, basically, out of nowhere, or that could be a good thing and we could reject the 23s and go lower and see a dead cap bounce. So we'll go over the VIX later. Just wanted to show you that. So just watch 537.45. That's kind of your key level right now. Small gap below. This is kind of a little rally-based rally demand zone as well at 534. That is a base candle you can mark as well. So we'll get rid of this gap so you can see this cleaner. So you got rally, base, rally, and also another rally base candle rally. So if you want to mark that, do that as well. Really any solid base candle that led to some kind of buying, you want to mark as long as it's a little red candle making a higher low like this. This is a higher low to higher high. This is a higher low to higher high. So demand, demand. Likewise, back here, rally, base, rally, and look how it held up right here. Also held up right here. So that's how demand works. They're looking for a higher low that led to higher highs. Rally, higher low, higher high, rally, higher low, higher high. So I just want to show you that. Make sure to check out my supply and demand zone crash course if you can. It's in the X-Trades YouTube somewhere. Go check it out. I cover all four sequences on supply and demand, you know, rally base drop, rally base rally, drop base drop, drop base rally, all that stuff. So go check it out. Supply and demand zones are great on the higher time frame. All right, and on to QQQ, which is actually just getting absolutely demolished. So QQQ is actually at that August 7th candle already that we were just looking at on SPY. Look how far SPY still is from it. Still got all the way down to 528, which is pretty far. QQQ, on the other hand, is already at its August 7th base candle from this day. So it's pretty close to demand, which makes me think we could be due for some type of dead cap bounce in this area. You also have 443, which is a very heavy wick area that led to a big buy imbalance. So all we're doing is marking past inflection points that led to big price movement. Like you got the all time high, big sell imbalance. You got a little wick out area that led to a big sell imbalance here. So that 484 wick right here played as res right here which led to more downside. Likewise for 455, you have a little structure base right here. Uh, once price got back over 455 right here, really big upside. You got the 443s wick area right here. Once price got over it with this bar, more upside. So that 443 a couple weeks ago was key to get back over. And then the 455 was also key to get back over. As you can see, as I marked and circled right here, here's our low from august 5th with the yen crisis so 423s definitely want to mark that and then you also have 41307 major low over here so that's our inflection points that's our big levels that i have marked right now i'll bring them right back up but there is something i wanted to talk about so a couple weeks ago in the last video maybe i'll pop up a clip we were looking at the 78.6 area as a potential top out area i mentioned it looked very similar so i want to show you that real quick and i'll pop it in right now if you draw out fibs too you do have the 78.6 which is at 486.20 just right here that could also act as a res area could reject at that area as well it did it back in october over here so the last time we had a very sharp sell-off you can see it lasted all the way through mid-august we bounced in august and then towards september 1st we rejected that 78.6 very aggressively so it's kind of similar to the pattern we have now very sharp sell-off v recovery we get up to the 78.6 now we have to kind of see is it going to reject the 78.6 now kind of like back in October of 23, or are we just gonna keep blowing through fibs, blowing through everything else and no type of VIX spike or any downside. So now that you've seen that, you can kind of see how it played out exactly like that. It topped out at the 78.6 and had major downside. Obviously it needed to lose the 50 EMA and also the 921 EMA combo, which it did here on Tuesday. We had two base out days, drop, base, drop. But yeah, that's really all I wanted to show you how it's crazy how cycles work like that. Sometimes you can kind of see the exact same thing in terms of seasonality or a similar structure. That's exactly what happened with QQQ here compared to September of 2023 and September of 2024 now did the same exact thing. We just haven't gone as low as that 2023 structure. So if we follow that exactly, we're definitely gonna retest the lows, you know, at 423, go a little bit lower, maybe 413, et cetera. But you kinda gotta just take it one day at a time. I don't like projecting too far out. I kinda go one day at a time, keep it within, you know, 3%, 5%. I don't call out for 20% crashes, 20% rallies and all this crazy stuff. I just kinda adjust off the daily bars, off the 
the weekly bars and go from there. So yeah, pretty cool. We kind of played out exactly how we did in September of 2023. But now I kind of want to go over what we're going to be looking for now going into this week. So we've already broken through the 455. That was a pretty good structure to hold up for bulls. We broke that on Friday. Now we're pulling into that rally based rally demand zone. And then you also have 433. So definitely watch this. This is the support that needs to hold that 433 and also this demand zone. Obviously, this demand zone does go kind of deep. Definitely don't just go all in once it gets into demand because it could still trade within it a little bit before going higher. Give yourself some room for error given how wide this demand zone and base candle is all the way from 446 down to 434. So about 12 points wide. And then also watch that 443, which is key from back here in May. You also do have a little bit lower until we hit the 200 EMA, which is kind of the bounce area last time. So we went below it, but then closed over it right here. So you can see that this bar did close back over the 200 EMA and that set us up for upside. So the 200 EMA is also a very good potential bounce zone. It's going to be about 440 right now. That will change by the day, but it should stay around 440 for the 200 EMA. So you got demand, you got 443, and also the 200 EMA at 440. So that whole area really needs to hold. And as well, maximum, that demand zone low down to 434 will need to hold as well. Otherwise, it can get ugly. Probably see 423 and 413. So just make sure you mark your key levels. Right now, it's 443. You also have demand you know, about 446 and the 200 EMA. And then just a reminder for SPY, you have 537.45 and also a little demand zone just below that at about 534, maybe 535. So watch those for SPY and QQQ. Those will be key. And if they break, it can get ugly. All right. And last but not least, we'll go over the VIX real quick. So we can kind of see we failed to close over that 2308. So 2308 was all the way back here from the October 2023 spike. It's kind of crazy. We only got up to that for that October pullback because that October pullback was pretty big in 2023. And we're kind of back at the same area, which is crazy because like I said and showed you, QQQ did that same 78.6 Fibonacci rejection at the same time period. And now we're at the same area kind of as October of 2023. Still a month early. Obviously, we're in September, but still the same time period and similar VIX level. So that's pretty interesting. Either way, VIX will need to get over 2308. Make sure to mark that 2308 comes from October of 2023 from Monday the 23rd and then you also have 2136 from April of 2024 those are kind of your old two peaks that we're near right now you definitely want to mark them and then obviously I mean the recent spike from the yen crisis goes all the way up to 6573 when Japan had a complete meltdown Sunday night going into Monday we had a complete break of the VIX and that brought us all the way up to 65 making it the third maybe fourth highest spike ever even during the financial crisis really any point of history this is probably the third or fourth highest spike and comparable to the great financial crisis of 2008 and also covid which makes no sense because it's really just one day right and we really didn't have cratering economic data we didn't have a recession we didn't have anything except for japan kind of blowing up overnight and the yen just going crazy and liquidating people but yeah that's really it for the vix uh 2308 that is the focus if we reject from 2308 i would expect it to come back down below 20 you know back down to 19 so on so forth if we start closing back over 23 i expect it to go higher first price target over 23 probably start heading back to 30 at least close to the 30 area and yeah that's really it you can see how accurate at this 23 level is I mean, it rejected here on Wednesday, came back up again on Friday, kind of rejected from there. Uh, the 2136 from April of 2024, got a rejection, a rejection. So these old levels from months ago, even almost a year ago, are still working, obviously. Maybe it's just due to the fact that you can kind of just do technical analysis on anything. Maybe it's just due to the fact that when the SPY technicals line up, the VIX technicals also line up and you'll kind of see that reflect in the VIX because VIX is based off of SPX option. So if there's more demand for puts, VIX is going to go higher, vice versa. So yeah, just watch that 2308 and 2136. Those are your two nearby levels. If we start closing back over that, we are going to be in a little bit of trouble maybe because VIX is not really at a capitulation point where you want to start just going 
going all in and buying stuff, this was definitely a capitulation point given how high it went and how low it closed after. I mean, it went all the way to 65 and only closed at about 38. So that was a pretty good buy signal to go long the market if you had the balls to do it. I didn't really go long for this recent spike in the VIX and also didn't go too crazy on longs even after the VIX came back down. I was just a little bit more hesitant and kind of going with the less is more attitude, which has kind of saved me, honestly, because the market's been a little bit tough lately kind of whipping people around you know spy goes that low and then all the way back to all-time high and now we're all the way back down already so just absolutely crazy a couple of months so far in the market there is one thing i want to show you too just one more thing before we log off here i want to show you this breadth indicator and we're going to kind of compare it to the spx i kind of posted this in the chat as well so this indicator on trading view is called s5 fi this is stocks above their 50-day moving average it's also a breadth indicator so this is kind of how you measure market strength and market weakness when you have most stocks over their 50 ema going higher obviously that results in higher prices so this little line right here this is the spx we'll make it orange so you can see but you can see it's very correlated with this breadth indicator so when the spx goes higher stocks above their 50 ema also go higher when spx goes lower stocks above their 50 ema is also going lower but you can kind of see how correlated it is and sometimes they will get a divergence too but right now lately it's been pretty accurate really you want to start buying the dips and catching those big rallies when this breadth indicator has gone a little bit lower so when stocks above their 50 ema crash lower right here you can see the orange line is the real s p also go higher and also stocks above their 50 ema go higher likewise for this low you have spx and stocks above their 50 ema going up very aggressively same thing right here stocks above their 50 ema kind of crashed bottomed out right here then when it went higher you also had stocks going higher crashed again came back down bottomed right here you have the indicator bottoming really strong bounce stocks above their 50 ema go higher and also the spx or the orange line also goes higher same thing right here you have a little dip or crash in breadth so stocks above their 50 EMA went lower, bottomed out right here, and then we had a rally. So you can see we're here right now. Stocks above their 50 EMA is still pretty elevated. I would say it might need to get back down to this kind of local area. It did last time. So it's like 25, 84 or something. So if breadth or stocks above their 50 EMA can get back down to here, or at least maybe this area, just a little bit lower, that could correlate with another bounce or some type of rally. And it might be October, maybe late September, given the seasonality. We'll have to see how that goes. But I just wanna show you, stocks above their 50 EMA is still pretty elevated. Like this indicator still has room to go lower before it correlates with any big bounce like these I've circled. So hopefully that makes sense. The candles are stocks above their 50 EMA in the S&P and the orange line is the real S&P or SPX. So you can see the correlation between the both. And the best bounces and the best areas to buy is when the breadth indicator is down here, down here, down here, much lower than where it's at right now so that's kind of what i'm using you could also use the equal weight s p or the rsp so there's an etf called rsp if you want to check that out the equal weight index is a really good breadth indicator as well it kind of moves like this indicator a little bit not the same but the equal weight is a very good breadth indicator to measure strength in the market so that way you're not just seeing one sector like semis or ai carrying the whole s p you kind of see everything moving together and keeping the market strong and the RSP or the equal weight index and also the stocks above their 50 EMA is a very good indicator to do that. Find local bottoms for when the SPX or the S&P or the SPY will bottom out, likewise top out. As you can see when breath topped out right here, orange line went down, real SPX went down. Another top out in breath, you have a little dip right here. Got a top out in breath right here or stocks above their 50 EMA. Orange line, real SPX also went lower even bring this to the front you have another top out and breadth right here but spx actually went higher still so even though breadth went lower i'm guessing we have max 7 or ai stocks kind of carrying us right here because even though stocks above their 50 ema went lower right here you can see the orange line still going higher but then we topped out right here as well and you have a dip in the real spx or s p likewise right here just a little dip in breadth and also the orange line or the spx and we have it going on again right here just i think the s p stocks above their 50 ema indicate needs to come down to here and then we can really see the spx or the orange line bottom out bounce and maybe we'll see some rallies like we've seen in the past when the indicator is bottomed out here 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 right here and right here so hope that makes sense i'm gonna go ahead and get this chopped up sent out i love you guys i'm glad to be back hopefully you guys enjoyed this video learned something from it hopefully the setups will be good as well i love you 
and I'm out. There's a reason why Xtrades is currently the fastest growing application on the market for sharing financial ideas. With over $2.5 million paid in the last two years to contributors, users are flocking to see what trades the top traders on the leaderboard are sharing in real time. If you're looking to grow your reputation as a trader on the internet or discuss your trading ideas with other reputable investors, click the link below and get connected with the trading mentor today, completely free of charge.